Hi, everybody. Welcome to the Patty Brennan Show. Whether you have $20 or $20 million, this show is for those of you who want to protect, grow, and use your assets to live your very best lives. Joining me today is Dan Mancini. Dan is a real estate agent with Keller Williams. And as we were talking, it became very clear to me that Dan is a lot more than a real estate agent. He's a real estate advocate. And when he's looking for properties for his clients, he's looking for properties that he would buy himself as an investor. And what is unique about Dan, or what I appreciated about our conversation is, he's got a unique approach to real estate that I thought it might be worth you hearing about. So Dan, welcome to the show. Patty, thank you for having me. It's an honor to be on the show. I've been listening to you since 2019. Congrats on over 100 episodes. I'm sure it's been smooth sailing since then. No black swan events to navigate for your clients. Mm. And congratulations on all your success. Thank you so much, Dan. And you know, 100 episodes in a way doesn't sound like many. You know, I think about everything that we've done and all the work that we've put into this podcast show, and it feels like we've done a 1,000, right? Um, and, and to me, it's not so much the number. It is more about the quality which is why I thought it would be great to have you on the show today, because I think that's what you're all about. So we're going to talk about rental real estate, and I think your perspective is very unique, as I said. I want to hear more about that. You talk about the four pillars of investing in real estate. So why don't we go ahead and begin to unpack that? What are the four pillars really all about? Sure. Yeah. So let me start with a couple things. There's a lot of different ways to invest in real estate. First and foremost, if you buy a home for yourself, that's a way to invest in real estate, right? You can do flips, right? If you don't know what a flip is, turn on HGTV. You'll learn all about them. You can do Airbnb. I'm sure we've all stayed in Airbnbs before. Uh, what we're going to be talking about today is long-term buy and hold rental real estate and the four main pillars of success there. You know what? That's a really good point. There are a number of different ways to invest in real estate. I wouldn't have thought about the Airbnb approach, and yet I do know people who have done that quite successfully, by the way. Um, so thank you for that. Thank you for that. So this is more about kind of the, the long-term buy and hold. And I think it's important for you and I to start out by talking a little bit about what has changed in rental real estate. It used to be a fantastic investment simply from a tax perspective. And then, lo and behold, don't you know, Congress gets wind of that, right, and decides to change the rules of that game. And as a result... Most people or a lot of people are not able to get the benefits, the tax benefits of rental real estate that we used to be able to get. There are income limitations. For example, you know, if you've got modified adjusted gross income of $150,000 or above as a as joint filers, you really can't take a write-off. And even then, below that, it's limited to $25,000. Not chump change by any stretch, but it's not the panacea that it used to be. So let's just kind of get that out of the way. And what is interesting to me is you don't invest yourself or for your clients in real estate for the tax benefits necessarily. You're looking at it as a cash flow cow. Absolutely. And to your point, I think a lot of the reasons that you mentioned with Congress is because the secret's out, right? Mm. There's a lot of landlords out there today. So the main thing we want to look at today is we're going to focus on buying a house and not a home, right? And that's a big mindset difference. Buying a home is a lot more qualitative, right? Mm. You're going to be focused on what I want to live there and what I want to raise a family there. Buying a house is going to be quantitative and an investment strategy, you want to take yourself out of it and look at would somebody else maybe want to live there. I love that approach. Dan, that's brilliant. Because really, you know, when we're looking at other types of investments, I always tell people, don't fall in love with your stock, right? It's just a stock. So it's the same thing here. Don't fall in love with the house, right? It's a house. It's an investment just like anything else. Absolutely. Excellent. Yeah. So let's get into the four pillars, right? I think to understand the first one, you want to look at the history of home buying in America. Uh, so up until 1938, mortgages used to look a lot different. So what that would require to get a mortgage would be a 50% down payment and a one to five year loan. Wow. Which is difficult to do. So let's put that into modern day terms. The average home right now goes for $454,000. 
right? So let's say you work with a great real estate agent. Let's say he works for Keller Williams, Devin Wayne, and he's able to get you $400,000, right? You steal 50K in equity. That would require today a $200,000 down payment and to repay back $200,000 within one to five years, right? And that's not even factoring in interest, right? That's a huge hurdle to have to overcome. And what's interesting about that to me is that that's what people in Europe have today. They don't have 30-year mortgages. They have adjustable mortgages or they have mortgages similar to that you've just described. Absolutely. And thank you for teeing me up there. So in 1938, Roosevelt signed the New Deal to get us out of the Great Depression. And that rolled out the 30-year mortgage. And that is so rare. We are one of the only countries in the world that offers a 30-year mortgage. It's not like that with business loans. A lot shorter terms in commercial real estate as well. So that offers such an opportunity to cash flow, right? And that's the number one pillar that you want to build your rental strategy around is cash flow, right? And let's define that. I know a lot of people know what that is, but cash flow is going to be the money that your tenants are paying you in rent minus your mortgage payment which hopefully includes taxes and insurance, right? And any expenses on the house. That's going to be your cash flow. That's what you want to build your entire strategy around. And that's the first main pillar. What's interesting about that is that cash flow is different than what you reflect on your taxes, right? Cash flow is what's in your pocket. The taxable portion of that basically it also includes this thing called depreciation, which you're still able to take, right? But it's a non-cash item that you're able to take as a tax deduction. So it's really about what is coming into you on a net basis after all the ter- all the costs that are associated with real estate. And some properties are going to have more than others, right? Absolutely. Yeah, and the thing I love most about cash flow is two things. Number one, predictability. It is so predictable to know that you're getting that monthly payment from your tenant each and every month. I don't know if a lot of other asset classes can say that. And number two is scalability, right? Okay, so let me stop you right there. Sure. I'm I'm here to play devil's advocate first Please to do. a certain extent, yeah. Dan. So let me let me play devil's advocate and say, well, it's predictable as long as you have that tenant and as long as that tenant is going to pay you right? Absolutely. So one or two months of a vacancy can really impact the internal rate of return on that investment of yours. That's a great point. And that leads me to the biggest mistake that I believe people make in accounting for cash flow, not budgeting for capital expenditures or CapEx. The cool Mm -hmm. kids at school call it CapEx. Cool kids. We're cool kids here (laughs) at Key Financial and, and Keller Williams. Exactly. So what CapEx is in a nutshell is budgeting for replacement costs and things to go wrong. Right? We can spend an entire episode talking about how to budget for CapEx. A good rule of thumb for investors is 1% to 2% of the purchase price. Divide that by 12 and put that into your cash flow model. Oh, that's terrific. Thank you for that. So, okay, we take into consideration the fact that sometimes you're going to have a bum tenant or stuff is going to go wrong. You build that, that CapEx into the assumptions because it's all about the assumptions and then figure out whether or not it's actually going to work on a cash flow basis. Now, in our conversations, the way I look at this whole model, and and you tell me if I'm wrong now, when we look at that return on investment, if you will, especially in the early years, I tell people, think about it as kind of like you would a dividend on a stock. And just like this, dividends aren't guaranteed either, right? the better companies will continue to pay their dividends on a quarterly basis and hopefully increase them. They are called dividend aristocrats. Those companies who for 30, 40, 50 years, every quarter of every year, they've increased their dividend. So it's also been an inflation hedge. With rental real estate, you also have that opportunity to have that rental income as an inflation hedge. And boy, did we see that last year, didn't we? Because those, you know, landowners were able to increase rents and pass along those higher costs to the people that they were renting to. So I see so many similarities between the two asset classes. Um, And I think it's important for us to recognize the opportunities that that do present themselves with rental real estate as an alternative to the standard things like stocks and bonds. Absolutely. 
Yeah. So let's take that one step further. Well, I don't want to get away from your four pillars. Sure, no, go ahead. Let's finish with the four pillars, and then I'm going to go through some questions, ideas. I want to pick your brain in terms of how you would think about, and I'll just tee it up for you now, Dan. What would you think about a property that really isn't cash flow positive yet, but it's got great potential? So you go ahead and you take the risk because all investing involves risk of one type, one thing or another. Like, what is that? How does that sound to you at this point in time? Does it make any sense, et cetera? So you don't have to answer now. Just teeing it up. No, I actually think that's a perfect way to get into the second pillar. Oh, cool. All right. There we go. By the way, you guys, (laughs) we didn't practice this. As you can tell, we're winging this whole thing. So, um, you know, we like to make it more of a conversation. It's just really spontaneous. Have great people who really know their stuff like Dan. And let's just really get to the bottom line. So sure. thank you for that, Dan. Thank you. Yeah, the second uh, pillar is market appreciation, right? So let's say we're cash flowing $100 a month mm-hmm. in cash flow, and we are hopefully our house is going up, right, mm-hmm. in value. If you bought in 2019, 2020, 2021, you definitely know what we're talking about here. Mm-hmm. Uh, the main point I would make about market appreciation is I believe it should be looked at as a bonus in rental property investing. I think if you're going to steal equity in a deal, it should be for the means of lowering your mortgage payment to cash flow more. I sometimes see people get burned trying to make equity plays going for market appreciation over cash flow. To your point that you're mentioned, you don't have to cash flow right away, right? If you're cash flowing within one to two years and you believe in the area, then I think it can make sense in certain investments. But I would view market appreciation as a bonus with cash flow being the primary means of investment. I love that, Dan. I love your conservative approach to this whole thing because so many people say location, 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 and are willing to overpay for that location, and they get burned big time. Or they just have a flat. You know, real estate is one of, in my, in my experience has been, real estate has one of the longest investment cycles of anything we can put money in into. When it's up, it's up for a longer period of time. When it's down or flat, it's also painful for a longer period of time. So anything in terms of appreciation, true appreciation, would be a bonus. Exactly. Like to your point, let's say it stays flat for a while, Mm -hmm. right? Your market appreciation, then your cash flowing, right? You're still getting that dividend payment that you compared it to earlier. And in addition to that, you have someone paying down your loan, right? Which is the third pillar of rental Mm. property investment, loan pay down. This is the biggest difference between owning a home and owning a rental is when you own a home, your mortgage payment is coming out of your pocket. When you own a rental, somebody else is paying you to pay down your loan, right? Mm. It's such a powerful mindset shift. That's why it's the third pillar. And let's say that equity does go down. You're still enjoying those two benefits. I think I think on it. Well, to me, that is the biggest one right there. You na- you nailed it because someone else is creating your your in- investment. You're just using other people's money in this example to create an investment that later on you could sell or you could continue to just live off those rising dividends over time. I always say to people, Dan, just so that you know, over time, maybe not every time. Because there are going to be those CapEx years where you're really replacing a lot or some renter goes out with not only your, you know, the stuff, they take the furniture, they take the toilets. I mean, you can't believe some of the stories that I've heard. And it's painful. It's really incredible to think that people could be that awful. And yet, got to look at worst case scenario before you get in. And that's what I think makes you a little a lot different. You're, you do the legwork up front. You're buying smart, aren't you? I would hope so, right? Yeah. That's the plan. Sure. You make your money on your, the day you buy. You're going to hear that a lot in real estate, right? Yeah. And that's what I love about this asset class is you can create a deal in the ways that other asset classes won't provide you. Okay. So let's, that's a, got number three. What's number four? Yeah. Number four is a topic you hit on to start the show, which is tax depreciation. Right. And I'm going to defer to you on that. I listen to your show a lot. I know you know a lot about that. I learn a lot about taxes from the Patty Brennan podcast. So if you want to touch base on that. 
I think that the depreciation aspect is still attractive. It's still a great reason to be investing in this asset class. So I don't want to downplay it too much because it can present itself an opportunity. I just want to be very real in terms of who's actually going to be able to take advantage of it or when they are. You do eventually get that back those losses, because when you sell a property, those carry forward losses actually add to your cost basis. So the so what you put into the property is actually increasing to the extent that you are unable to take those deductions. So you do get them. Um, so I just want to be very real in terms of when, right? And who also. And by the way, the Internal Revenue Service and our government is creating incentives to encourage that velocity of money. And they do it through the tax law. They encourage businesses like mine and yours to to take risk with our own capital, start these businesses, feel that fear of what it's like to start with nothing and have no income and provide a valuable service that people want and need. That's what you do. That's what we do. And for that service, you're compensated. The Internal Revenue Service had to find, and our government had to find a way to encourage people like Dan Mancini and Patty Brennan to take that risk. And so they did it through the tax law by saying, hey, guys, If you're willing to do this, we're going to allow you to take certain deductions. And those deductions include things like my cell phone. As you know, Dan, I was putting out a lot of fires this morning before our podcast. I was doing it from my cell phone. As a result, that's a tax deduction. So those things, those incentives are really important. And they increase the net after-tax return that you receive on that investment, whether it be a piece of real estate, a rental real estate, whether it be your own business or anything that you might want to put money into, a retirement plan. They're basically incentives to solve potential social issues, as you said so eloquently. It's giving people a place to live at a reasonable cost that they can afford. That's what rental real estate can do, right? Businesses like yours and I, we needed an incentive to somehow take the kind of risk that we were willing to take. Retirement plans, we get an incentive to put money into 401ks and IRAs so that we don't become dependent on the federal government during retirement. So, Ultimately, when you break it down fundamentally, the rules are there, A, to create revenue for the government, to allow them to provide services and goods to people who are not in a position to be able to provide for themselves. That's a social network called our government. And creating incentives for people like you and me. And rental rental real estate is one of them. And I think you're telling that story if I may say so eloquently, Dan, in a way that I hadn't heard before. Thank you. I just want to touch base on one thing you mentioned, the velocity of money, right? And that's why I love Key Financial and your show so much. Last year, you heard a lot that the markets are down. Best not do anything, right? Best investors are dead investors because they don't touch their money, right? I don't subscribe to that theory. And it's comforting listening to your show that you tax loss harvested as a company four times last year. Right. You're encouraging I-bonds right? You're promoting doing Roth conversions, which is such an awesome time to do that. So it's awesome to hear that. And I think you can do well not doing anything, but I'm not sure you can be Forbes number one wealth advisor in PA sitting on your hands. Thank you, Dan. Boy, that was completely unsolicited, everybody. So just so <laughs> that you know, thank you so much for saying that. We do what we do because we we feel it from our hearts and we want to add value to the people who are willing to give up their time, call it a half an hour or 45 minutes to listen to these ideas because not knowing about them, you're not going to do them. And if you don't do them, well, that's money that could be left on the table, right? So getting back to this, let's kind of pull this together. Oh, Ah, here's a question. (laughs) I'm just cheating for a second because we have some notes. Interest rates, mortgage rates, Dan, they have more than doubled. Why in the world would anybody want to get a mortgage now? Right. Last year was the only time in U.S. history that mortgage rates doubled, right? Mm. And why I think it's, again, we're talking about buying a house over buying a home today. 
if you can find a property that cash flows at interest rates now, one of two things is going to happen. You can refinance, get a lower interest rate in the future, cash flow even more, or you lock in an interest rate now, watch them go up, and feel really smart. Right. right. So either way, heads you win, tails you break even. Right. And one more point on interest rates. This is just my personal belief. Uh, they are a hot thing to talk about at parties, right? Mm. Everyone says, oh, what interest rate did you get? And you're like, wow, that guy got a 3.25 and I have a four. Right. What am I doing, right? The conversation stops there. Mm-hmm. No one talks about, hey, how much equity did you steal? What prop? Or how much did you appreciate? Where did you buy? Uh, I think there's a lot more that goes into home buying than just interest rates. And I think we fall victim a little bit to making the conversation a lot about that. So I would just encourage people to keep that in mind. And that's why, again, I love this asset class because you can create so much value by the way you structure your deal compared to other asset classes. You know, Dan, for a young guy, you're pretty wise. Wow, that's so true about what people talk about at parties, right? And interest rates are only a part of the overall equation. And I also love your term of stealing equity. Let's take let, let's dig into that a little bit. What do you mean by that? Right. So in December of 2022, because of rising interest rates, 44% of sellers gave concessions. Okay. So what that means to people out there listening is they compromised a little bit. Just six months before that, that wasn't happening. Mm-mm. It was the bidding wars. You were waiving concessions. No seller's assists were allowed. So the market has changed. And when that happens and there's more inventory available on the market, you have the opportunity to make offers much below asking price. It's a very important point because we don't know what's going to happen. But let's pretend that the consensus is right and we end up in a recession this year. When we have a recession, unemployment goes up. When people lose their jobs, a lot of times they also lose their homes or they choose, they decide that they can't afford to live there anymore. And you don't want to exploit somebody's vulnerability. Yet at the same point, I think that people got a little bit too giddy when it came to market values of their homes. And they're getting a reality check right now. And as an astute buyer, you can really probably take advantage of that. Now, is now the time? I don't know, right? I don't know what's going to happen with interest rates. I can tell you what is expected by the Fed as well as the market. And I will tell all of you, those two entities do not agree. The Fed is out there talking about keeping interest rates higher for longer, bumping them up, continuing to increase to fight inflation. The market is saying, I don't think so, because inflation has gone down tremendously. The money supply, M2, is negative now. So there may be reasons to think that, to your point earlier, maybe interest rates might go down. Don't know. Don't want to necessarily make a decision based on that, because to your other point, all that matters is what you're paying. And right now, if you can find a property that makes sense for you as an investment, as real estate, you know, income for real estate income, that's what really matters. And you'll worry about the interest rate later. Yeah, absolutely. And I think what's happening in the housing market is healthy, right? I think houses were getting a little bit overinflated. The thing I would advise buyers is to look at the supply problem in mm-hmm. America right now. We have very little homes available and our building of homes has fallen off a cliff as well. It's very interesting that you bring that up because I have several builders who are clients, and without mentioning names, of course, but I I don't know about you, Dan, but I feel like they have a little bit of PTSD after the financial crisis. Absolutely. They really got hurt, and they did not want to get into that same situation ever again. So they they, they make good you know, prudent business decisions for themselves by not getting into, you know, properties, buying as much real estate, getting involved as much. And as a result, there is a tremendous shortage. So that too is going to work its way. We always go, we always do this thing where we go 360 one way, 360 the other, and then we get back to equilibrium. Um, The question is when? So it's an interesting time in real estate. It's an interesting time. And I think 
if I may say, I think the more important thing is align yourself with the right people. Get the right advisors who are truly fiduciaries, who are going to look out for your best interest. To me, having put out a couple fires today, I find and believe that ultimately is the most important thing, that people are really um, personally involved and really care to the point that they'll go to the nth degree to get you what you want, what you need, and sometimes maybe even save you from yourself. Absolutely. That was a great point that you made about the builders as well. And there are positive signs to building, right? Uh, A good indicator of that is lumber prices and the lumber markets, and those are starting to tick up a little bit. And to your point about 2008, I 100% agree. I do think people have some PTSD from that. I grew up through that, so I 100% understand that. What I would encourage people to keep in mind is that was a lending issue. And it's reassuring when I get on the phone with my mortgage broker and they're saying they're tightening things up a lot, Mm -hmm. right? It's kind of the opposite because everyone has that PTSD. So it's reassuring to me when I hear that from them about banks requiring 25% down for rentals sometimes instead of 20, just really making sure they're tightening things up. So that gives me some peace of mind. Absolutely. 100%. I don't think we're going to see something like that again in our lifetimes. I hope at least. And you're right. I think it it really truly was a a lending issue. So the standards are very high. And the only thing that I would add to this whole conversation is if this is something that someone's interested in, there are different ways to do a mortgage. So the 30-year fixed loan is great. And by the way, there are other ways to craft that. There's 10-year fixed, there's seven-year, et cetera. Just to touch base on that, they just rolled out a 40-year mortgage. No kidding. Yeah. Wow. Bringing it back. I would encourage people to think twice about that. Mm -hmm. You can't afford the 30-year one. Maybe the 40-year one's not your best bet. But from a rental perspective and a cash flow perspective, it would provide you more cash flow. So it's food for thought. There's no right answers there. That is a really interesting angle. Okay. That's something I'm going to have to think about. (laughs) So, Dan, is there anything else that you'd like to add before we end the show? There's one fifth pillar of rental property. Oh, really? uh, yeah, there's a lot of debate one. about this, but okay. I, uh, I subscribe to it and it's value add, right? So quite simply, if you spend $6,000 to put a bathroom in and comps in your area support that that extra bathroom will get you twenty to 25000 you can create value that way in an asset as well. Hmm. Okay. That's very interesting. You know, you can't exactly do that with a mutual fund, right? Right. So it's an interesting angle. Um, I would be careful with that a little bit. I would want to make sure that that really does have the return on investment. That sounds high to me, to be honest with you, to play devil's advocate again. Absolutely. So, you know, again, it's just one of those things. I I would look at it more if it's... If, if doing the bathroom would increase your your ability to get more rent, sure. another 200 bucks a month, oh, yeah, then, you've, then you can calculate the payoff, right? Right. As well as potential appreciation. I wouldn't necessarily count on the appreciation unless it's one of the properties that you've talked about that you've bought, and that is you really got a great deal, right? It could be location. Location, location, location. You know, it's the old buy the cheapest house on the block type of thing. Um, And again, it would be a bonus. Absolutely. I think it's the idea of being able to cash flow a little bit more if you just do those improvements. Absolutely. That that make it interesting to me. To your point there, too, one of the best things you can do for a rental is try to add an extra bedroom. Oh, that's it. It's one thing we've done a lot is turning two bedrooms to three bedrooms. Your cash flow is going to substantially increase if you can do that. So is there an ideal number of bedrooms and bathrooms and stuff? Tell me more about that. Uh, So there are a lot of different ways to invest in real estate. I'm going to keep saying that. Uh, But I believe a three bed is going to rent out for a lot higher than a two bed, as well as a two bathroom compared to a one bathroom. Mm Mm-hmm. And just think about it, right? Yeah. You know, like you don't want, if you have a three bed, one bath, you don't want three people sharing one bathroom. And again, we're talking about buying a house and not a home, right? Mm -hmm. So think about if other people would want to live there and their quality of life as well. 
you know, it brings me back to the way I grew up, Dan. I'm one of seven kids. My mom had eight pregnancies in eight years. We shared one bathroom. Honest to goodness, in the mornings, we would wake up and, you know, somebody would be have their head over the tub washing their hair. Somebody would be on the toilet and somebody else is doing their makeup. It was nuts. And we just rotated. You know, it was crazy. So it's amazing the things that you can get used to. Um, but I understand in today's world, I don't know that that would ever happen. Um, <laughs> but it is uh, it is kind of interesting. I'm so. with you. My mom is one of seven, and my stepdad is one of 14. Wow. Not a lot of TV in the house, right? Yeah, you know, you're not kidding. <laughs> All right. So you at the end here, you talk about resources. So tell me about the resources that you would recommend to people who might be more interested in this. Now, obviously, do you mind if I give them your name and number and all that stuff? Not at all. Obviously, you can call Dan. He's with Keller Williams. His phone number is, okay to give the cell? Good to go. All right, 610-564-1172. Dan's email is Daniel Mancini, M-A-N-C-I-N-I at kw.com. You are one of many resources for people. What else might they consider? Absolutely. Yeah. So the biggest thing I would uh, tell people to do is find a great agent or a mentor, one that's been through the process before, Mm -hmm. specifically themselves, right? I think you learn a lot more by doing than by teaching. So I would encourage people to do that. In addition to that, there's great resources out there. Uh, One of my favorite books, and it's a book that's been recommended on almost every podcast I listen to by successful people is called Rich Dad, Poor Dad. I brought you a copy mm-hmm. and in case you want to uh, check it out. But I've it is... already read it. <laughs> okay. Oh, good. yes. Um, but it's frequently, um, it's frequently recommended in the real estate investing community. In addition to that, you're going to be hard-pressed to find a rental investor that hasn't heard of Bigger Pockets. It's a website podcast. They have over 750 episodes dedicated to rental property investing in every way, shape, or form. That's great. Okay. Thank you so much. Dan Mancini, this has been fantastic. I learned a lot. Thank you for your time, your energy, your expertise, and thank you for being a resource for me and all of our clients. I really appreciate that. I, and, and, oops, scratch. Got it. Yeah. Patty, since we're breaking, Mm -hmm. um, with regard to Dan's info, I don't know a lot of people that are going to driving and we're going to link your contact info up in our show notes. Okay. So yeah, so I'm going to have Chris redo this. So if you'll just say that, just give me a pickup okay. line. Yeah, Bye. you know what, Dan? I'm going to give your contact information. As a matter of fact, I'm just, we're going to link it up in your show notes. Okay. And that's all I want you to say. Okay. And, and Chris, uh, we're at 4715 when Patty comes in to do this pickup line. Do your pickup line. I'll have that locked in. Then we can come back. And Dan, thank you so much. This has been fantastic. I'm going to give our – what, what am okay. I saying? You're saying uh, – is it okay to give your contact okay. info? Okay. Yeah, you know what, right. Dan? And pretend like you're going to read it and say, you know, yeah, what, I'm yeah, like, yeah. we're going to link that, Dan. We're going to link that up in our show notes. Yeah. Dan, try to fix your left. To my left. Yep. Okay. Cool. Yeah. You know, rather than read off your information, your phone number, your cell phone, we'll go ahead and put it in the show notes. Is that okay with you? Absolutely. Thank you so much, Dan Mancini. You've been fantastic. This has been terrific. I've learned so much in our conversation today. And thank you for being a resource for me and for everybody that we are privileged enough to touch. Absolutely. Well, thank you for having me and thank you for all the great work you do. You betcha. And thanks to all of you for taking the time to tune in to our show today, learn more about rental real estate with Dan Mancini and me. It's a fascinating asset class. If you have any questions, please go to our website at keyfinancialinc.com. Please let us know what you thought of the show, if you have any additional questions for either Dan or me, and let us know if there are any other topics that you'd like me to cover in the show. A lot of the things that we talk about are as a result of, you know, emails that we've gotten from people just like you. So let us know how we're doing, what you want to hear about. That's why we exist. So thank you for tuning in, and I hope you have a fantastic day. Take care now.